just listening into everyone's conversations. <laughs> they sounded very interesting. Uh, good morning everyone, welcome to our service for this morning. Um, now, we are, this is our second Sunday of our summer mini-series where we're going to be doing things slightly differently. If you were here last week you'll uh, know what we're doing, um, but if you weren't here last week, just a quick explanation. So instead of um, our normal few songs, reading, sermon, few songs afterwards to respond. We're going to break it up a little bit and instead of reading the passage once, we're going to read it four times throughout the service and each time we're going to have, be given time to reflect on a different aspect of that passage. So um, list, first of all, listening to it, um, then imagining ourselves as an eyewitness to that scene. Um, third one is imagining ourselves as the main character in that particular story. Um, and the fourth one is just sitting in quietness and listening to God as we reflect on that passage. So uh, we are going to be doing all four of those throughout the service. Uh, if it's not your cup of tea, then it is only for another couple of weeks. We're going back to our normal structure in September, but um, it is just a different way of experiencing the Bible and experiencing God and reflecting on the passage. Um, so today our main character, if you like, uh, that we're going to be thinking about is Thomas and particularly his experience after the resurrection um, when he, people call him Doubting Thomas, I think that's an unfair name, um, but where he um, wanted evidence that Jesus had risen from the dead and to put his fingers um, in the wounds. Um, so we're going to be thinking about him and his mindset and um, the people around him throughout our service. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your presence with us this morning. We're going to be thinking a lot about your presence among us as we go through our reading today. And we really do thank you that you are with us this morning, uh, with us through our preparations, through our pain, through our sadness, through our joy through all of our lives, Lord, you really are with us. And we pray that we will experience you through the words that you were inspired John to write all those thousands of years ago. Amen. I'm going to hand over to Mike for a couple of songs. Let's stand to sing.
Uh, Mark, could we have the PowerPoint slider, please? Okay, so as I said at the beginning, we are focusing our um, theme around thinking about Thomas. And um, we're, the reading that we're going to be reading is John 20, chapter, uh, John chapter 20, verses 19 to 29. And this first one, what we're really inviting you to do is to listen with the ear of your heart. So notice if any phrase, sentence, or word stands out. At the end of the reading, we're going to have a pause for you to gently repeat that word or phrase to yourself and allowing it to touch you deeply. That's the end of that one. So you can write stuff down on your little slip of paper that you were given in if you'd like, or if you want to close your eyes and just listen and write it down later, that's fine. Um, but it is John chapter 20, verse 19. On the evening of, that fir of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So what phrase or sentence or word stood out to you there? Like it says, just repeat it to yourself gently, allowing it to touch you deeply. And then after a little time, we'll sing another couple of songs. So in my preparation, as I was reading through that passage, the thing that stood out to me is that Jesus was in their midst. He stood right in the middle of them and revealed himself to them. And the songs that we're going to sing, the next two and, and the one after the next reading, is all about that. Jesus being right in our midst so we can worship him. Thank you, Mike. Thank 
So the second way we're going to think about this passage is imagining you're an eyewitness of the scene. Maybe you picture yourself as John watching all of this happening and remembering it and recording it for his, for his gospel. Maybe you're one of the other disciples. Maybe you're Peter. Maybe you're James. Maybe you're Andrew. Maybe you're Philip. Whoever you are in this scenario, just imagine that you're stood there and watching it firsthand. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and he said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the other disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the, uh, seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas <coughs> was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So, yeah. If you were an eyewitness of that scene, what did you hear as all that was going on? What did you smell as everything was happening? What did you feel? What did you touch? Were you one of those disciples who were invited to feel Jesus' wounds? What did you taste in that scenario? Just give you a few seconds to think about that and note it down on your piece of paper before we sing again. As we sing this next song, keep on thinking about that. Maybe you just want to sit and listen to this one or you can join in and stand and, and sing along as well. But uh, yeah, just keep that in your mind. Feel free to remain seated.
So the next subject we're going to think about is, is what if we are Thomas ourselves? How do we react in that situation? And just, it's quite, I was going to say fortunate, but it's not fortunate. It's God's plans. There's no such thing as fortune. But it's God's plans that this is the week that we share communion together. And uh, as I was thinking this week, I was thinking back to the last time that Thomas would have seen Jesus would have been at the crucifixion and how fitting it is that before we think about Thomas we just get into his mindset of the the last time that he saw Jesus where he was being dragged up and nailed to that cross and then he died and placed in that tomb and as we commemorate those acts that Jesus did just want to get into that frame of mind of how Thomas would have felt in that situation before he saw the resurrected Jesus. So we're going to share communion together. Perhaps those that are serving with me would come be seated. Thank you, Andy. Thank you for leading us so beautifully to this point. Um, I was uh, struck in our prayer time about how the Lord set up the temple and uh, how in the outer courts all the business went on. But as you drew through to that inner place, to the Holy of Holies, there's all this stillness and there's the place of God's presence. And I feel in a way as we enter through the different readings of this scripture. We're entering into that holy place, and this is that meeting place with God, isn't it? We were paying attention last time to Mary's encounter with the risen Jesus. This week we've been thinking about Thomas's encounter with the risen Jesus. I remember Thomas, he's a bit of a hero of Lynn and I. Um, he was with the other disciples when Jesus said that he was going to go and raise Lazarus. And it looked like a certain death mission. And Thomas says, let us also go that we might die with him. <laughs> there's a bravery in that though, isn't there? And there's a miracle in that moment when Thomas is at the second meeting because he didn't believe. He thought they were all bonkers. Why was he there? It was all rubbish. So why was he there? But he came. And it was Thomas um, who said, when the Lord had been talking about going ahead of them to prepare a place, Jesus said, you know the place where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Good point. Jesus' answer. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If Thomas hadn't been honest, would we have had that answer? So we come to this meal. The meal where Jesus said, on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread and prayed and gave thanks. And like him, we give thanks, Lord. We thank you for these symbols rooted in the Passover, the setting free of slaves, rooted in the memory over generations but finding fulfillment in Jesus Christ, who said, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup, eats and drinks eternal life. And Lord, we pray that as we eat and drink today, we might recognize the body of Christ around us, the body of Christ with us. And may this bread, a symbol of your body, Feed our faith to eternal life. Amen. Amen.
having given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. He said, do this in remembrance of me. I'm going to ask the service to come and to serve you and invite you, whether you're here with us or at home, perhaps get yourself some bread to join with us in this process. Um, just to eat that bread, to remember Jesus, to remember his physical body broken for us and yet raised to life. We use um, individual cups here as we share the uh, wine together, but we invite you to hold on to that cup as a symbol that we can then drink together as a sign of our unity. And again, wherever you are around the world, if you're listening to this later or, or watching online, why not have some juice? Just join with us in this remembering of Jesus. It was after the supper that Jesus took the cup and he said, this is a new covenant, that's a promise it's made certain through the blood of Jesus. He said, this cup is a new covenant. And elsewhere he said that it was given for the forgiveness of sins. I don't know how you come today. Broken. Recognizing that we've fallen far short. But this cup is a reminder that his blood was shed not for the healthy, but for the sick. Not for the righteous, but for the sinner. And he invites us to drink this cup in remembrance of him. Until he comes, says Paul. One more time, one fewer time, before the Lord returns. So if you keep the cup, we'll drink together. Thank you. Lord of Jesus, we shed for you. Lord of Jesus, we shed for you.
of Jesus was shed for you. Susan, his blood was shed for you. Um, as I was distributing communion, I, I knocked the glass and I spilled some. The blood of Jesus was spilled for us. His blood was poured out for you. There is no more fitting thing than to spill the communion wine because his blood was spilt for us. So as we remember him, we give thanks in our heart that he shed that love abroad, that it reached even to us. We drink with thanks. Lord, as we gather at this table, we lift our brothers and sisters to you, joined across the world and across the ages into the great body of Christ, the bride of Christ, looking forward to that wedding day, the feast, the wedding feast of the Lamb. Lord, thank you that you have joined us together by your Spirit in unity. Whatever may divide us, this unites us, that we are saved by your precious blood. We look to you to the day of completion. And we ask, Lord, that everyone that is in that position of struggling with doubt will be brought to that place of belief today. That you give them peace as they rest into your arms. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, Mike, we're handing back to you. <coughs> we're going to sing um, one more song um, before we um, get back into the readings. And so, we're going to take this a little slower than we might be accustomed to. Please um, stand to sing. Um, but seeing it reflectively, I'm sure you won't let's stand. <laughs>
so yes, this time we are going to imagine ourselves as Thomas. And um, <coughs> like Chris and Lynn, Thomas is one of my mini heroes. Like I said at the beginning, he's given the nickname Doubting Thomas, which I think is unfair. I think he's much more of a pragmatist, maybe, a realist. Some would say a pessimist. I don't like that term. But, you know, he's, he's very practical. He doesn't think in automatically get the spiritual things that Jesus is trying to sell him. He's, he's much like I am, actually. He wants to see the evidence before he believes. And, um, yeah, as we read through it again, just imagine yourself as that pragmatic person, that person that just wants to see the practical side of things, doesn't see a way through in the spiritual realm, and, uh, but by the end, very much does. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, he, after he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the other disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So what thoughts, feelings and reflections arise within you as you imagine yourself as Thomas in that situation. Personally, I think I would think that I was very foolish for not understanding what Jesus had said and, and guilty maybe that you didn't believe what your friend was saying to you. So yeah, just imagine what you would have felt were you Thomas in that situation. And we're going to listen to a very well-known old hymn now. Um, the words are going to come up on the screen, but the idea is that you sit and listen and reflect on those words, because I think the first verse very much sums up um, where Thomas might have been after this. And as we progress through the verses, it gets slowly towards the bit that we're going to be thinking of next where we're going to read the passage for the final, fourth and final time and think about what God's saying to us specifically through that passage. So we're going to listen to um, the hymn, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. Hopefully. Dear Lord and Father Simple try. 
Yes, in this final there we go. in this final reading of our passage from this morning, the idea is to just feel like you're in God's presence as you read the passage for the last time. Oh. So yeah, maybe close your eyes and just listen and rest in God's presence. Listen for that voice that speaks through the earthquake and the fire, that still small voice of calm. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. <coughs> and with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. <coughs> A week later, 
His disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not yet who have not seen and yet have believed so just some prompts jesus looks at you with tenderness in his eyes he looks deep into your soul what does he say what might god be asking of you through the scripture that we've read this morning give you some time to contemplate that um, we are going to have a time of um, an opportunity to share what you think God's been saying to you if you think it's something that needs to be said to the wider church then please do come up um, as ever the microphone is yours um, and while you think about that we're going to sing a few songs and um, Mike and I will keep an eye on the platform so to keep it quiet if someone's got something to say.
I had an email this week from a, a Christian minister in South India who um, I pray for and we email each other. And he told me, uh, well it's very difficult uh, as church leaders in India because there is an awful lot of pressure from Hindus, Hindu nationalism to say, well, don't take notice of all this Christianity, it's a modern... <coughs> It's a modern European thing. And of course as Baptists, well I don't know if you are all Baptists, probably not all traditionally Baptists, but Baptists know that William Carey was the first Christian missionary who went to India with his friends and took the gospel round about 1800, the late 1700s or about 1800. So we know the story of how the gospel went to India through William Carey and the Baptist missionaries. But did you know St. Thomas went to India? And uh, my friend in South India, they've been out on the streets talking about Christianity and saying it's not a European thing. St. Thomas came to India and he planted churches in India and he brought the gospel to India. Now, it's not in the scripture, I know. And at the Reformation, we said, well, let's chuck out all that Catholic stuff that's not in the scripture. Martin Luther said, sola scripture, only the scripture. Uh, but to be honest, there's some stuff in there that we ought to know. St. Thomas went to India uh, and he eventually planted some churches in South India. Like St. Paul, he went to the Jewish synagogues. There was one or two in India and he planted the gospel there and the gospel took root and it grew and it's been in India. Uh, but the one thing I think is important once Thomas knew that Jesus had risen from the dead, he had to make it known. And our trouble so often is, well, we're Christians, we're good at our devotion, but what about our witness? What about telling the world that Jesus is risen and Jesus lives and Jesus is Lord? Two things. First, uh, often in scripture you, you don't get the rests. You know in music they have that little symbol for rest. Uh, so you get to, in last week, when Mary cries out, Rabboni, and then Jesus says, don't hold on to me. We were discussing last week, you don't know how long in between Mary shouting, Rabboni, and Jesus saying, don't hold on to me. It's been. If I was Mary... I would never want to let him go again. I was thinking about Thomas, if I can get through this without crying. He's had a rotten week, hasn't he? Everybody else has seen Jesus. Why not me? And the first time you get Jesus, he says, Shalom, peace be with you. Why has he said that? The first time he says it, I'm sure the disciples are, wow, it's Jesus. 
And then he has to say it again. It's like, you know, once he said, you know, um, uh, whoever you forgive is forgiven, who, whoever's not forgiven. You know, they're all crowding around him, and I'm sure, you know, hugging him and bowing before him, grabbing hold of him. And he says, okay, <laughs> peace be with you. And he breathes on them, doesn't he? But, and, then, and Thomas has missed all that. So the second time, and this is what's really struck me today, they're on a different position to Thomas. I reckon they're all around looking at Thomas with big beams on their faces. We told you. <laughs> and all Thomas is filled with is, wow, he really is alive. And this is the thing. Jesus knew what Thomas had said when Jesus wasn't visible to them. He knew exactly what Thomas had said. And he reflected that back to him. Do you think Thomas actually put his finger in? I don't think so. I think he's just lost in worship, isn't he? So just spot those, those places in scripture where maybe there's something happening that's not dialogue, but it's there. And I think that's when we open up the scripture like this. It gives us a chance to think of that, doesn't it? To imagine those moments that are perhaps not dialogue. So that's what struck me. I was struck right really from the, the moment Andy started uh, the service. Um, what leapt out at me was uh, it, I, God could have, you know, reacted in many different ways, I guess, at this point. Um, but it's the way, uh, the, the reaction here, that, that God meets us where we're at. You know, he could have, you know, gone and said, well, actually, you know, Thomas doubted. And he says, well, you, you doubt? Well, that's it, I'm done with you. <laughs> you know, you doubt. But he didn't. And, and this is what I find amazing is that, you know, it, we might react, you know, by going, well, look, I, I've just, I, I've had enough of you because, you know, I, I've, all the effort I've put in, everything you've seen, and you still just don't get it. I'm, I, I'm off. I've got other people to, to, to see. And I've got other people who follow me. But you don't. But that's not what God does. God meets Thomas where he's at. Despite his unbelief. You know, he meets him where he's at. And without any condemnation at all. He takes him from where he's at. To a place of faith and strength. And sends him on his way. And that's what really struck me. It doesn't matter where our faith is at. It doesn't matter how much unbelief or lack of faith we have. God doesn't condemn us for that. He goes, okay, that's where you're at. I'm going to meet you where you're at. And I'm going to take you from where you're at to a new place with me. Totally true, Rick. How many of you can say, I've never, ever doubted? And looking at the text, looking at this morning and everything that's gone on, it's even more clear to me that Jesus put Thomas in the place that he needed to be at that time to understand what Jesus was all about. So Jesus really and truly put Thomas on his own with him face to face. And Thomas had no alternative but to say, my Lord and my God. And I think that applies to each and every one of us. There has been, will be, or, or even is now, a time when God will confront you and say, ask you to say, you are my God.
Ladies first. <laughs> I think your first few words stuck with me more than anything. Peace be with you. Oh, wouldn't that be great in this world we live in? All the troubles in the world. If only peace would be with them. And the second thing that struck me was if you don't forgive, it's not forgiven. And that's probably a lot to do with the problems in the world. If only we had peace. If only we would forgive each other. If only people in authority would take note. Just two thoughts, peace and forgiveness. It would make this world a much better place. first thing I wrote down in the, in the first section was stop doubting and believe <laughs> and uh, that just seemed to hit me because <coughs> probably like a lot of you I'm not without moments of doubt uh, in terms of my faith and, and, and where I am uh, and so I just wrote that down and then I was pondering on that and thinking about it as we went through the process. And the second, the second part where we had to imagine we were actually in that place, I, I wrote dark room, in, in a dark room and there was dim lamplight and the smell of burning oil in the oil lamps. And there's fear. And then Jesus is suddenly standing among us, among them, I put us because I'm supposed to be there. <laughs> um, and I wrote down shock. And, and I wrote that last week as well, when Mary Magdalene suddenly saw Jesus and realised it wasn't the gardener, it was actually Jesus. And I wrote then shock. And it seems to me that, that these, these appearances of Jesus must have been shocking <laughs> when, when it first happened. Yes, eventually there would be delight and joy, but I'm sure the first impression was fear. You know, what, what is this? What's happening? Um, we often say one of, the, one of the most common things that any appearance of maybe it's an angel or something like that, the first thing they say is, don't be afraid. <laughs> Don't be afraid. And I think in a way that's what Jesus was saying when he said, peace be with you. You know, just, just relax, be at peace. It's me, it's really me. Uh, and then the, the last thing I was thinking about, or wrote down, though the doors were locked, Jesus came. And if you think of doubt, in terms of locking Jesus out. And I realised that, that that was me. I'm Thomas. <laughs> I was Thomas. I didn't believe. And I'd locked the doors against Jesus. But, <laughs> praise God, he came. At some point in my life, he broke through those doors that I'd locked against him and transform my life and I just want to give thanks for that so I've kind of been sitting here thinking my journey is a bit like Thomas's journey um, and I'm so grateful that through the locked doors Jesus came
stand to sing.
just one last opportunity if anyone's got anything to share that they think that God's put on their heart well um, I forgot to mention before we started the service um, that we have a barbecue this afternoon uh, <laughs> Probably, well, I was about to say the most exciting part of the day, but I think the last hour and a half has probably been the most exciting part of my entire week, let's be honest. Um, so yeah, we've got a barbecue, so don't rush away. Um, after the service, you are more than welcome to join us. There's plenty of burgers and sausages and rolls and people have brought salads and all sorts for us to share. So um, through there... Um, starting at about one o'clock so if you need to walk the dog or something <clears throat> nip home get your um, extra bits and pieces you've got time to do that um, but yeah please do join us um, I think that's it um, we've intentionally had a more reflective and contemplative service this morning so it's been a bit slower paced um, and some of our music choices have been a bit more not subdued, but, you know, reflective and relaxed and, and that kind of thing. But last week we finished with a great Easter song that, that Lynn and Dave um, led us in. And uh, today I wanted to do the same. And um, it's one of my absolute favourites. Um, and it was one of my granddad's as well. We had it sung at his funeral. Uh, and it is very rousing. So um, I couldn't not have this service and finish with this song. So, right. You might just know it. Let's stand. <laughs> Thank you. 
remember when they watch the last night of the proms and they, they play that tune, sings along those words. I don't think they're the words that the people in the Albert Hall sing along to, but I sing along those words. It's a... <coughs> anyway, I can't say much more other than that, other than, um, yeah, let God be with us as we go from this place this week and uh, as we reflect on what we've learnt from Thomas's story. Yeah, just, Lord, take away that doubt and that fear. Stand right before us so that we can say that you are our Lord and our God. Amen. Amen. So, yeah. Barbecue at one o'clock, teas and coffees served in the room behind me. Have a good week. <coughs>